Good evening, boys and girls. Uh, one of the things I like to do before I go to sleep every night is to read a good book. So I thought I'm going to read a book a little bit every night to those of you that are in the older grades. The book is called Floors, and it is a series book written by Patrick Carmen. It's one of our scholastic books, and I'm, maybe you'll be wanting to read the rest of the series after I'm finished with book one. I'm going to read for you what the book is about, and then we'll get started. There's mystery and adventure on every floor. There's no other place on earth quite like the Whippet Hotel. Each and every floor has its own wacky design and its own wacky secrets. The guests are either mad or mysterious, and ducks are everywhere. Leo Fillmore should know everything there is to know about the Whippet Hotel. He is the janitor's son. But a whole lot more mystery gets thrown his way when four cryptic boxes are left for him. Boxes that lead him to hidden floors, strange puzzles, and an unexpected friend or two. Join Leo as he takes the ride of his life without ever having to step outside. As the hotel starts falling apart and the mystery thickens, there's only one thing Leo can know for sure. The future of the Whippet Hotel depends on him. I love a good mystery. Let's see how mysterious this one is. Merganser Whippet was an impulsive young man of 15 when he raced into his father's room just in time to hear these fateful words. Merganser had just finished his 10th consecutive year of boarding school, during which his father had been building a financial empire. Needless to say, the two had never been close. The words were not the sort of thing Merganser's father was known for saying. People close to the old man would have expected something like, buy cheap, sell high, and whatever you do, don't squander the family fortune. But 12 seconds later, Walter E. Whippet was dead. You will prosper in the field of wacky inventions were the only words of advice Merganser had been given. If only Merganser had known they were spoken by a man who'd been talking gibberish for several weeks. Things might have turned out differently. Here we go. Chapter one. Leo Fillmore woke to the sound of snipping. It was Mr. Phipps, the gardener, trimming and shaping the bushes outside the small window his ghostly shadow moving across the basement walls. Every Monday, at the crack of dawn, Mr. Phipps trimmed outside Leo's window, the echo of the shears like a voice that seemed to say, Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Leo sat up in bed and thought first of his mother's voice. Then he thought of ducks, and then he thought of breakfast. After that, he remembered the one thing he'd hoped to forget in his sleep. Merganser D. Whippet, the owner and creator of the Whippet Hotel, was gone. He'd been gone a long time, 100 days and counting. And Leo was beginning to wonder if the man who'd built the most extraordinary hotel in the world would ever find his way back. He tried to set this thought aside as he watched Mr. Phipps' shadow pass by. Leo was a small boy of 10 with a sizable blob of curly hair on his head. Were she still alive, his mother would have cut it months ago. Sometimes Mr. Phipps, who was quiet by nature, would look at Leo's head like it was a small, tall green hedge that needed trimming. When Leo's mom died, he and his father had moved into the basement boiler room from which the two of them took care of the Whippet Hotel. Five years later, it felt like the only home Leo knew. They slept on cots separated by a glugging whirlpool washer. There was a desk made of cinder blocks with an old door for a top, piled high with tools and manuals and receipts. The basement window let in soft light and shadows. There were other larger tools and boxes everywhere and shelves full of old doorknobs and hotel parts. In the dampest, darkest corner of the basement sat a giant leaky boiler. It may sound as if the boiler of the Whippet Hotel was a shabby sort of place to live, but it was cozy and especially cool in the hot summer months. Leo loved the warm sounds and smells, his threadbare blanket, the tiny kitchen that folded down from one of the walls, and the gulping boiler that never seemed to sleep. As Mr. Phillips moved on, the sound of snipping, growing softer outside the window, Leo tiptoed to the coffee maker and the paint-splattered sink. Soon enough, the coffee pot filled the basement with the rich smell of morning, and Leo's father started to stir. A few minutes later, Clarence and Leo Fillmore stood in their pajamas before the call center, taking stock of the day that lay ahead. The call center occupied all the space above the makeshift desk and it was but one example of the strange and unusual things Mr. Whippet had created throughout the hotel. There were bells and buzzers and lights on the wall that flashed and spun. 
There was a horn with brass pipes that twisted all along the ceiling. There were dials, banks of buttons, and meters with water pressure readings and temperatures. And in the very center of it all was a shark's head, its crooked teeth smiling gleefully. Under the shark's head was the word Daisy, presumably the shark's name. Daisy looked as if she had come blasting through the wall and gotten stuck there, forever cursed to deliver messages in the Whippet Hotel basement. We've got about 30 seconds before she wakes up, said Clarence Fillmore, slurping the coffee and scratching the gray stubble on his chin. Daisy's eyes were closed as if she were in a dream, chasing a school of terrified goldfish. We'd better get out of these pajamas. Leo knew better than to doubt his father's intuition. Clarence Fillmore had an uncanny sense of timing when it came to the Whippet Hotel and its many needs, so Leo had already pulled on his maintenance overalls by the time the first message arrived. Daisy's eyes opened wide, and the sound of a ticker tape machine filled the basement. Lights blinking, yellow and green, a sign that whatever message Daisy was about to deliver was not a catastrophe. If a water main had burst or the air conditioner had gone on the fritz, there would have been a siren and a wail and red lights, which were both very unpleasant at the crack of dawn. A thin strip of white paper, like an endless fortune out of a fortune cookie, curled out of Daisy's mouth. Mrs. Sparks, as I suspected, Clarence said, ripping the curling paper from the shark's crooked teeth with his big hand. It wouldn't be Monday morning at the Whippet without her. Leo took one end of the long curled strip of paper in his hand and looked at it curiously. I used to think Mr. Whipp Whippet was in charge of the orders, even if they came from someone else, he said. I guess I was wrong. Clarence Filmer looked at his son and felt a little sad for the boy. You know, Mr. Whippet wouldn't leave for good without the ducks, Clarence said. Stay focused, Leo. It will take your mind off your troubles. And besides, the last thing we need is Mrs. Sparks breathing down our necks all day. Clarence Fillmore was a big, lumbering man, often slow to speak. Like a giant in the basement, he was constantly ducking under pipes and ductwork. Leo had long understood that these characteristics of his father made some people think Clarence was a simple maintenance man without much going on upstairs. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Taking care of a hotel, especially this hotel, required an encyclopedic understanding of architecture, machinery, cooling systems, heating systems, plumbing, duct control, and a million other things. Without his dad on the job, Leo suspected the Whippet Hotel would probably keel over within a week. A day without Mrs. Sparks would be nice, Leo said. Sometimes I wish he'd go on vacation and never come back. Mrs. Sparks, who had become more and more demanding each day Mr. Whippet did not return, was the desk clerk and general manager of the hotel. She had long fingers for pointing out all the things Leo and his father hadn't done, and she wore an outrageous beehive hairdo that seemed to say, I'm in charge here. Don't cross me. Whenever Mrs. Sparks gave a command to the maid or the gardener or anyone else, she leaned forward and gave them the evil eye. Her great hair, head of hair teething over her, whomever she was ordering around, casting a dark shadow. On this particular day, Mrs. Sparks' ticker tape list of things to do was four feet long. Before Mr. Fillmore could read the entire thing, Daisy was at it again, only this time the paper was pink and the red siren was spinning and howling in the basement. Leo tore the ticker tape from the shark's mouth and Mr. Fillmore flipped a switch on the call center, silencing the alarm. Leo read the pink message. The ducks are on the ledge. We're going to stop there. I'll continue reading again tomorrow. I also will have a book again for primary. I hope you all sleep well, have sweet dreams, and good night.